lethal levels of radiations, out-of-this-world anomalies, and bloodthirsty factions. These are a large part of the zone's dangers, but the forbidden area around Chernobyl would never be as threatening to visitors without its creatures and mutants. Hello, stalkers, and welcome to the Anomalous Dugout. In this video, we will talk about the local monsters, and more specifically, about the strangest and most mysterious beasts of the exclusion zone. Before taking a closer look at every type of these special mutants, let's start with some general information about these creatures. All the mutants in this category are monsters whose origins are much more complicated and mysterious than the others. In the previous videos, we talked about simple animals who became mutants, and humans who were turned into monsters. Well, the creatures we're about to present here are more than that. They are neither animals nor humanoid. Sure, some can have behaviors and appearances similar to animals or humans, but it is impossible to tell from what species of animal they came from. Others don't even seem to have a physical body, or at least, not anymore. Much like with all the other mutants we have seen before, the question of the creature's ability to reproduce is very important. In other words, can these special monsters breed? Well, since these mutants are more mysterious and quite diverse, answering this question is not easy. But in my opinion, I would say that the answer is no, they cannot reproduce. Anyway, without further ado, let's take a closer look at each kind of these special mutants. A real ghost from the zone for some, a myth told around the campfire for others. The poltergeist is one of the most confusing entity in the world of Stalker. Indeed, not only is information about this mutant coming from various contradictory stories and legends, but its appearances between the different games of the trilogy are inconsistent as well. So let's start with what is always the same about the poltergeist. In all three games, the creature is depicted as some sort of floating cloud made out of electric arcs, which actually makes a sound reminiscent of electrical sparks. Moreover, the poltergeist's main ability is telekinesis. In other words, it is able to make objects fly, and it uses this power to throw heavy things at its enemies. Because of this appearance and this method of attack, the monster is often considered to be some sort of ghost or spirit, and it is obvious how it got the name of poltergeist. If you don't know, a poltergeist is a type of ghost which is known for making physical disturbances, such as moving and throwing objects. Alright, now on to the differences. In Shadow of Chernobyl, killing a poltergeist will reveal its physical form, its body, if you will. Basically, when the creature dies, its powers stop, and its real body appears, before falling down onto the floor. This corpse appears to be a humanoid torso. It has human arms, but the legs are missing, and the head is quite weird. It looks like it was directly fixed to the torso, getting rid of the neck. Also, poltergeists can be heard shouting upon their death. Despite the fact that this physical body exists, when they are alive, the poltergeist can be traversed without any harm, which is the same in all three Stalker games. The really strange thing is that in both Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat, the physical body of the poltergeist was removed. When killed, the mutant simply disappears, leaving nothing behind. However, shooting the poltergeist and hurting it 
will still cause bleeding, which might indicate that the creature still has a body, but it's just somehow concealed. Also, in Call of Pripyat, poltergeists lost their ability to find an enemy if it stops moving, indicating that their detection is based on movement or on sound. So, why is this mutant different in every single game? Well, there is no definitive answer to that question, but we can make some speculation. First of all, it should be noted that all poltergeists in Shadow of Chernobyl are found in the same location, which is Laboratory X-18. Inside the lab, many elements make it obvious that the poltergeists were created as part of secret experiments. Therefore, it is possible that the poltergeists found in X-18 are of a certain type, perhaps some sort of prototype version of the creature, which was not able to hide its physical body upon death. And the poltergeists found in the other games were later versions of the experiment, which were more successful. Another possibility would be that the poltergeists in Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat were normal poltergeists that escaped from their labs and mutated or evolved inside the zone, which changed their abilities. And then there is also the theory that the poltergeists in Shadow of Chernobyl are man-made, but the others are not. They would have been created by the zone itself, because of the anomalies and other strange phenomenons happening here. In fact, there is a rumor among the people of Chernobyl, according to which the poltergeists are the spirits of stalkers who were hit by massive amounts of radiations. Often considered to be a special version or a subspecies to the poltergeist, the pyrogeist is basically an arsonist ghost. It has a similar appearance to the poltergeist, but with orange glowing flames instead of blue electric arcs. The pyrogeist, however, does not move objects around. Instead, it is able to create pillars of fire, similar to the burner anomaly. It could even be argued that these are, in fact, temporary burner anomalies, which might hint at the fact that the pyrogeist is able to slightly affect the noosphere. Regardless, this ability is quite dangerous in confined spaces, especially since a single pyrogeist can fire a lot of these burners. Moreover, and despite the fact that the pyrogeist is never seen making objects fly, it seems that the creature does also have strong telekinetic powers. Indeed, the specimen found in X-18 is able to bang hard at a locked door, and later on it will block another door until it dies. Meanwhile, in Clear Sky, a group of pyrogeists is attempting to prevent Scar from escaping the Agroprom underground, using an unknown force to push him back. In any case, the pyrogeist is more consistent than the regular poltergeist, as it does not have a corpse in any of the games and will always die the same way, in an explosion of fire and blood. Once again, the fact that this mutant bleeds might indicate that it does have a physical body, only it is somehow hidden to our eyes and we are able to walk right through it. Also, much like it was done with the poltergeist, the pyrogeist's ability to spot targets was changed in Call of Pripyat, so it could not detect you if you were not moving. Now let's talk about the origins of the pyrogeist. We saw earlier that Laboratory X-18 made it quite obvious that poltergeists were the result of experiments. Therefore, I think it is safe to assume that the same is true for pyrogeists, especially since a pyrogeist can also be found in Lab X-18. 
Were pyrogeists part of a completely different experiment from poltergeists, or are they normal poltergeists that evolved, perhaps at the contact of thermal anomalies? We don't know. Alright, to finish with the pyrogeist, we'll have to go into some important spoilers, so if you want to skip that, go to the time which is marked on your screen. So, you're still there. Good. Because I want to touch on one very interesting pyrogeist encounter. Around the end of Shadow of Chernobyl, when you try to destroy the generators in the secret lab in order to deactivate the monolith device, pyrogeists will start to spawn in the room in an attempt to stop you. This can only mean one thing. The people behind the creation of the zone, that is the sea consciousness and its allies, prepared a mechanism of defense using pyrogeists. This pretty much confirms that pyrogeists were man-made inside laboratories, but also it probably means that the sea consciousness is able to create these pyrogeists. Indeed, I find it hard to imagine that they would find pyrogeists, capture them and keep them around as a security. Although it's actually possible, who knows. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that the sea consciousness and its scientists can create poltergeists, which originally were invented in X labs. This means that there is at least one laboratory somewhere in the zone which is producing stuff for the people behind all of this. It could be pyrogeists, but also a whole lot of other kind of mutants, much like we talked about in our previous videos. I think this is the reason why some rare mutants, especially humanoid ones, can be found everywhere into the zone. And they always come back after being killed, despite our assumption that they cannot reproduce. I believe that somebody or something simply keeps creating these monsters, and they are deployed to serve the needs of the sea consciousness. On a side note, this still active lab could also be responsible for the production of armors and weapons of the monolith faction, including the famous Gauss rifle. Anyway, to conclude on the pyrogeists, it is definitely one of the strangest and most unique entities in the zone. The largest and most powerful mutant known to live in the zone, the pseudogiant is a very rare and dangerous creature which can weigh up to 2 tons and stand 2 meters tall. Because of this, the monster will shake the ground when moving, which is a strong warning for anyone nearby. And it is able to create local shockwaves in order to attack the targets that it cannot reach. Furthermore, the pseudogiant is incredibly hard to kill, as its skull can be up to 10 centimeters thick. Thus, its brain is very well protected but some of the creature's complex functions are also located in its spinal medulla, which is clearly visible on its back. Taking a closer look at its appearance, it is described as a massive drop-shaped abdomen with a pair of disproportionately large limbs. In fact, the pseudogiant has four limbs, two huge and muscular legs, that allow him to move around surprisingly fast, but also to grab any poor soul who would dare to come too close, and two smaller human-like arms that he can use to stab his victims. Also, the beast has some sort of a tail, which is composed of a large foot and a thinner part of the tail. Moreover, the face of the pseudo-giant looks like a deformed and enlarged human face, especially the eyes. Because of these characteristics, there is a theory that the creature is actually made out of several human bodies, 
that have somehow combined and mutated together into one living being. In any case, it is clear that the pseudogiant shares some traits with humans, and its mutations are so advanced that it was probably the result of laboratory experiments on human test subjects. Yet, the real nature of the pseudogiant remains a mystery. Sure, some of them can be found in secret underground facilities and laboratories, but not all of them. In Call of Pripyat, pseudogiants also emit a lot of radiations, and their body will continue to be radioactive even after its death. This may indicate that radioactivity is the source of the monster's mutations, but it's most likely just one of the causes. Interestingly, the pseudogiants that are found in underground compounds are usually stuck inside, as their large size does not allow them to escape. This is especially apparent in Lab X18 and the testing workshop. It is possible that the monster was small when it first came to these places, and then quickly grew bigger, trapping itself in the process. Perhaps pseudogiants have a very fast and sudden growth. Who knows? In fact, its PDA description makes mention of adult specimens, which probably means that children pseudogiants also exist. Does this mean that pseudogiants can reproduce? Personally, I don't think so. As I've explained in the last video about humanoid mutants, it is possible that somebody or something is still creating mutants somewhere inside one of the secret labs, and these newly created mutants are sent into the zone. Therefore, I just believe that when pseudogiants are created, they are much smaller than those found in-game. But after some time, the monster quickly gains a lot in size, thus becoming the threat that we know of. Obviously, this is just speculation, so don't take it for granted. Another strange thing is the monster's ability to survive in these confined and closed areas. How can such a big mutant live without finding any food down there? Well, my theory is that the pseudogiants are able to enter very long phases of sleep, during which they consume almost no energy at all. Something similar to hibernation, if you will. This would explain why the creature can usually be found asleep in its idle state, and the large roar it screams when it is startled is due to the frustration of being awakened, or simply because it finally spotted something to eat after a very long sleep. The most dangerous predator of Chernobyl, the Chimera is a very fast, intelligent and silent hunter, which is often considered to be the deadliest creature in the zone. For some reason, the beast was only present in Call of Pripyat, yet trophies of stuffed Chimera heads can be seen in both Shadow of Chernobyl and Clear Sky. It is possible that the mutant is too rare to have been encountered by the Mark I and Scar, or maybe it only appears in certain parts of the zone, such as Pripyat and its surroundings. Anyway, the Chimera looks like a lion with sharp claws, no tail, and most importantly, two weird heads. One of the heads is bigger than the other, and looks a bit like a human head, while the other one is basically the same, but smaller. The creature also has pointy ears, which combined with its terrifying grin, have earned the Chimera the nickname of Devil. Hopefully for stalkers, it seems that most chimeras live in solitude, yet Trapper revealed that duos of chimeras also exist. Moreover, the mutant is considered to be a nocturnal predator, despite the fact that random chimeras can be found hunting in broad daylight.
Much like the pseudo-giant, it is unknown how the chimera was born and from what living creatures it was derived from. Considering its appearance and name, it can be assumed that the mutant is an hybrid, created in secret labs by mixing different parts of several animals, and possibly humans as well. Indeed, the name Chimera comes from Greek mythology, where the Chimera is known to be a monster whose body was part lion, part goat, and part snake. Today, the word chimera is used in biology to designate an organism which is made out of cells from two or more individuals. In any case, the chimera from the zone was most likely the result of biological experiments aimed at creating a perfect predator. It is unknown why the beast has two heads, but it might be the sign of a superior intellect or hint at the fact that the chimera's organs are all duplicated in order to increase its survivability. This is never confirmed in-game, but it was planned to be part of the chimera's lore at some point in development. Finally, if we take into account everything that we said before, as well as the very small numbers of chimeras in the zone, I believe that they are not able to reproduce. But then again, we actually don't know the truth, so unless it is officially confirmed, it's just speculation. And there we go! In three episodes, we've spoken about all the mutants from the zone, at least those that appear officially in the final games. Of course, there are more things to talk about regarding mutants, such as zombies, cut monsters, and more so it's possible that we'll come back to these subjects in future videos. Anyway, thank you for watching, stalkers, and goodbye.